Well, as part of our election coverage, we're doing interviews with each of the national party leaders. Each was offered either traditional one-on-one -on -one interviews or to have us follow along on the campaign trail. Liberal leader Michael Ignatieff is tonight's guest. We met this afternoon here in studio. You know, this morning I was spending a little time on YouTube going through some of your uh, early speeches as leader. Mm -hmm. And I found uh, there was kind of a consistent message in the first things you were mm -hmm. telling Canadians, that you were promising, you know, a new kind of politics, mm -hmm. new civility, end to the spite and spin of the old political game. How do you square those early promises with the kind of campaign you've been running, especially in the last week, especially the television ad campaign that you're running? I think we have to be tough. I think we have to frame up the issues. I think Canadians want to know what the choice is on May the 2nd, so that's the first thing. I think the other thing is we've run a very positive campaign in the sense we are trying to do it differently. I'm up in open mic town halls every night of the week pretty well and been doing this not just in the campaign but over the last two years. I don't think Mr. Harper's taken an unscripted question from a Canadian in five years. Well, there's no doubt that you were, you've been doing the town halls. You have a very positive message out of the gate. But it seems in the last few days that's turned a bit. There's the Rise Up speech. We'll want to talk about that in a moment. But the television ad campaign, I assume you see these television commercials before they go on the air? Oh, sure. I take responsibility for everything that comes and out of the campaign. And we feel, we feel a strong, tough uh, campaign here is essential. Canadians need to know that Mr. Harper's numbers on health care, for example, don't add up. Can you trust this guy on health care is a key issue in the campaign and we want to square that up clearly so there's no fooling around, there's no mistake. And so uh, we, we think a strong, aggressive message that says clearly you've got to choose here is very important. Well, you go beyond that. You're saying that he wants absolute power. What does that mean? Well, we've got a prime minister who shut down parliament twice. We've got a parliament, the prime minister is the first prime minister in history found in contempt of parliament. We've got a prime minister who, when he holds a public meeting, throws a young kid out because he doesn't like what's on her Facebook. The thing I get in every one of my town hall meetings is, can you trust this guy with power? That's the issue. But what's absolute power? I mean, the, 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 the ad you're running now has got the, you know, the somber music, dark tones to it. There's a lot of fear in that ad, and the key words are absolute power, that that's what Stephen Harper wants. What's absolute, what is, is that code for a majority? What does that mean? The issue, the issue here is can you trust this man with power? This, this, is a, this is a prime minister who, in, in my judge, you know, every time someone stands up, let, let's take an example, um, the veterans ombudsman. He stands up and defends veteran. He gets fired. Every time a you know, professional public servant gets up and says something, say, about the Afghan detainees, he gets smeared. Helena Georges, you know, smeared and dismissed. The question that Canadians are asking is, can we trust this guy with power? And that's why we're running tough campaign ads to make it clear that that's the choice. You, you see, if you can't trust a man with democracy, if you can't trust him, you can't trust him with anything else. You can't trust him with the economy. You can't trust him with uh, health care. And so we think it's wrong. And, you know, also, hey, let's have a reality check here. I've had two and a half years of the politics of personal assassination from these guys. I think it's important to, to stand up and fight for what we believe, What's too. What's the worst? Well, why didn't you? I mean, if he was running ads against you for two and a half years, you never responded to them. What, what is the worst thing that he said about you? Well, it's always an attack, Peter, about whether I'm a Canadian, whether I'm a patriot. And after a while, you think, hey, you don't have any, you don't get to choose, Mr. Harper, who's a good Canadian and who's a bad Canadian. That's what he's been trying to do with, with me. And, and I'm saying a Canadian is a Canadian. I fought two elections, won the confidence of the people. I got a right to be in the room. This is my home, right? So I fought that vigorously for two and a half years, and we're fighting vigorously in this campaign, and, and we're going to have a choice on the May the 2nd between who do you trust here? Who's in your corner here? Is it going to be Mr. Harper? The priorities there are very clear. $30 billion on jets, you know, $13 billion on jails, corporate tax giveaways. Are you going to stand up for the Canadian family with this family pack we got, which I got here? There you go. Um, hopefully we'll talk about jets and jails as well, because at one point or another you voted for both those programs, and now you're using them daily uh, as a charge against them. But, but let me get back to the other thing. It's the worst thing he said about you in the last couple of years is where he's questioned your patriotism. This is the same guy you're now questioning his trust, whether he's trustworthy. Mm -hmm. 
is patriotism the worst thing he's said about you questioning oh, whether you're a patriot? I can, you know, if we start on a long list of the things that he said about me and our party which are false, we'll have a long conversation that I don't think Canadians want to watch. The one that the one that he's been trying to say over and over and over again is Mike Lignatiev is not you know, a Canadian. I, you know, and I take deep exception to that, not because I care so much what he thinks about me. I've long cast caring what he thinks about me, but because there's an issue of principle here. He doesn't get to choose who's a good Canadian. The Canadian is a Canadian, period. Let's have a debate about principle. Let's have a debate about, you know, and I've, I've not attacked his family. I've not attacked his, you know, private character. I've not attacked his, you know, dad. I've not attacked his wife. You know, I've had all of that. That's not the issue to me. The issue is let's have a firm, tough discussion about principle. And I don't think he can be trusted on health. I don't think he can be trusted on the economy. I think his numbers don't add up. Right? And that's, those are the issues that I think are fundamental in the campaign. And that's where the moment of truth is going to come on, on May the 2nd. In the last week, um, since you were in Sudbury last week, you've come up with a new speech. I don't know whether it was planned or whether it just happened, but whatever the case is, it's, it's got people talking, this rise up speech, where you list, as you've just done, a number of things that you think are undemocratic on the part of the Harper government. And as you list them, you say, Nobody's talking about this. People are saying, so what? And you're, you get madder and angrier as you go through that spiel in your speech. But it still keeps ending up with the, no one's listening. Or they're saying, so what? Mm -hmm. Now, it seems to have engaged your base. There's no doubt about that. They seem to like it. Mm -hmm. But why are Canadians, in general, not listening to what you say is happening? Well, but Peter, I think there are. They are. If you're if you're in Victoria with me two nights ago, the place is full to the rafters. If you're in Edmonton the night before, Edmonton is not exactly it's tough ground for liberals. The place was the biggest meeting anybody had in 15 years. But still, I mean, they, they, but, that, the majority of those people are either dyed in wool liberals or liberals who are looking no. back again. Peter, with the greatest respect, what I noticed in all of these meetings are the number of progressive Canadians from all parties who are saying. We've got to get rid of Stephen Harper because we can't trust him on the democracy issue. So my sense here is that there is a very large number of Canadians, I'd, I, I believe actually a majority of Canadians, who don't trust him with power and are looking for an alternative. And that's why they're coming to our meetings. They're coming to listen because they want to be persuaded that there's a progressive, responsible, down the middle of the pipe kind of alternative on the 2nd of May, and that's what we want to provide. So what was the so what about? If there are people out there who are listening, why, why were you suggesting they weren't? No, because we've, we've had a whole series of stories that begin to add up into a pattern, and each one taken on its own, people think, oh, yeah, okay, he shuts down Parliament. Well, that's a little unusual, and then he gets found in contempt of Parliament, that's a little unusual, and then he throws somebody out of a political meeting, and. What I'm trying to is, is join the dots up here so people see a pattern that I think is, is bad for the country. So the same question you know, goes to you. If that was the scenario and Mr. Harper had the most seats but couldn't win the confidence of the House, mm -hmm. what would happen? We, we cross that bridge when we come to it in the sense that... that but you said Canadians no, let, let, let need me, let me to know what, you know what the different parties would do in a situation like that. If, all right, let's, let's run it right out so we're all clear. If Mr. Harper wins most seats and forms a government but does not secure the confidence of the House, and I'm assuming the Parliament comes back, then it goes to the Governor-General. That's what happens. That's how the rules work. And then if the governor general wants to call on other parties, or myself, for example, to try and form a government, then we try and form a government. That's exactly how the rules work. And what I'm trying to say to Canadians is I understand the rules, I respect the rules, I'll follow them to the letter, and I'm not going to form a coalition. What I'm prepared to do is talk to Mr. Layton or Mr. Duceppe or even Mr. Harper and say, look, we've got an issue here. How do we solve it? Here's, here's the plan I want to put before Parliament. Uh, you know, this is, this is the budget I would bring in, and then, then we take it from there. Would that add, we talked about it at the beginning, this fear of absolute power, this dark days that could be possible if Stephen Harper formed a majority, which I, I've got to assume is what you're talking about in, in terms of absolute power. Um, but you would just sign off and say, that's fine, away we go. Well, Peter, what question are you asking me? Here, if the people Well, I'm if asking the people you why decide, you're running that ad. If the people decide, that's how the people decide, and I respect that. But I think it's absolutely legitimate in a political campaign to prevent 
present clear, absolute choices. I don't, you know, and this is a personal thing for me, and I think it's also felt by the millions of people who support our party. We don't trust him with power. We don't trust him with the health system. We don't trust him with the economy. And we need to say that clearly to Canadians. And we feel there are millions of Canadians who feel exactly the way we do. And come May 2nd, we want them to know that's, that's what's it's at stake. I've run a campaign based on hope, appealing, appealing to hope. I mean, practical hope. You know, if you want your kids to get to college and university, vote liberal. If you want early learning and child care for your family, vote liberal. If you want a Canada pension plan you can count for, vote liberal. These are positive, hopeful things we want to offer uh, on the 2nd of May. Now, this, Jack, Jack Layton would say if you want all those things, vote NDP, that he's offering much the same. Now, I don't know whether you heard what he said last night, but he said that basically, when it cuts right down to it, your platforms are the same except on Afghanistan and that there are different leaders. Other than that, the major difference is that you've had power, the Liberal Party, um, and are forced with having to defend a record of it, and they're not. Uh, let, me, let me show you something, Peter, uh, on that point. This is a costing table. I'm not going to get into the weeds with you, but that shows you exactly how a Liberal Party would pay for its platform. Jack, with all, Mr. Layton, with all due respect, has got a costing table that doesn't add up. There is a world of difference between a liberal platform that is based on holding corporate tax at 18 percent, right? Uh, a, a you know, we can pay for everything we have said we want to do, the learning passport, early learning and child care, family care in the home, without raising the taxes of ordinary Canadians. But would you, see, and, would and, you and, agree and, that and Mr. A, Layton, in truth, cannot make that promise. Would you agree that there's a certain similarity to the planks in the platform? The differences are how it's going to be paid for? Well, when with it's going to happen? Again, with respect, Peter, I don't think that's accurate. There's no other party out there that's offering a learning passport. Learning passport is, I think, the most transformative investment in post-secondary education we've seen in a generation. It says, if your kid wants to go to college or university, we will, you open a savings account, we'll put $4,000 in there. New money, not recycling, new money to help you go to college or university. That's not in the NDP platform. It's not in the other platforms. This is because we think Investing in education, our kids' education, is the single most important thing we can do for the sake of our economy, but also for the sake of equality. I mean, the thing that makes this country work and, be, and been so successful is our commitment to equality of opportunity. Nobody gets left out, and I don't want any family to be excluded from the promise of a college and post-secondary education, and thousands of families are. And that, the only party talking about that is us. You know, unlike uh, the other leaders, for the most part, you're new to politics, recent, last five yeah. years. Um, what has this taught you about the political game? Because, you know, I, and I hate to use the word game, but when you came into it, you had some pretty lofty aspirations about how it should be changed. And I'm wondering whether you look back on those mm. thoughts and wonder whether you were being naive about mm. what could happen. Oh, gracious, Peter, I've had a whole lot to learn. It's been, an ex it's been a humbling experience in the sense that, you know, I've spent my life, as you know, as a communicator, whether I was a journalist, whether I was a teacher, and I thought, well, I can communicate, that ought to be easy, and you, you have to learn that, you know, reaching out and connecting in politics is a, is a whole other order of difficulty. But, you know, I really feel, I really feel we are. I mean, I, I, you know, I was in Sudbury on Friday night. Guy gets up in one of these open mic town halls. I don't know what people are going to ask me. A guy who's been a trucker all his life, he's wearing a big Stetson hat, he's been on the road for 25 years, he says to me, Mr. Ignatieff, I had to go off the road after 25 years because my wife got sick. For two years I've been looking after her in the home. I need home care. I need home care. And he said to me, your plan, your home care plan, will actually make a difference to me. And I thought, bingo. I thought, we have connected. This guy understands exactly what a liberal government might do for him. And that's a moment, you know, that is just unforgettable in, in your political you life. Is enough time to uh, convince a lot of other people of that? Yeah, we got 13 days. Someone once said a week is a long time in politics. Harold Wilson. Yeah. Or, and I, no, I, look, I, I, I feel that, that, that people are listening, people are tuning in. 
Um, the Canadian people have been um, incredible to me over five years, just incredible. Forgiving of some of my failings, but always willing to listen. I'm confident we're, we can win this one on the 2nd of May, Peter. We really can win this on the 2nd of May. Mr. Ignatieff, appreciate your time. Thanks very much for doing this.